Hello, everyone. I'm Hamed Okravi from MIT Lincoln Laboratory. I'm the session chair of this session. Uh, this session is about leaks at various layers uh, of a computer system. And we have an exciting set of talks that are talking about uh, both attacks and defenses in this area. Uh, so th to get things started, our first uh, speaker is going to talk about acoustic uh, keystroke si uh, leakage from smart TVs. He's Tejas Cannon from uh, University of Chicago. Tejas, please take it away. All right, thank you all for being here. Today I'm gonna to be talking about our work on extracting keystrokes from the audio of smart televisions. Smart televisions are TV devices that support an internet connection, allowing them to have browsers and third-party applications. With this increased amount of functionality also comes an increased amount of user interaction. And unlike prior television systems, Modern smart TVs actually have areas where users can now input sensitive information directly into the device. For example, inputting passwords to connect to Wi-Fi networks or to log into accounts, or even payment details in order to make purchases, for example, when enacting a new subscription. The way that users will actually input information into smart televisions is through an on-screen virtual keyboard, which looks like something shown here. Users will actually interact with these keyboards through a wireless remote, which contains a direction pad. Individuals can actually control in a cursor that's placed on this direction pad by sequentially moving the cursor through directional commands. For example, if we know that the cursor is on the key Q and we want to move to the key G, they can hit the right button four times and the down button once to get to the desired place. One thing that's worth noting here is that these virtual keyboards don't actually have any restrictions on the user's movement, so they can take a relatively freeform path between keys, and in particular, users need not even take a shortest path. Thus, what we have here is that with modern smart televisions, users can input information directly into these systems, and common platforms like Samsung and Apple actually have an additional feature and that they actually make sounds as the user interacts with the device. Small clicking noises as the user will move between keys and potentially select a character. Based on these sounds, the key question that we're trying to answer in this work is does this audio produced by the smart television actually leak any information about what a user is typing on the keyboard? Now, the reason that this type of leakage can be problematic is if we consider an attacker who's passively listening to the television as a user is typing into it. An attacker can gain this type of access by potentially placing a malicious recorder anywhere within listening range of the device, or even potentially hijacking a device already in the room that has a microphone, where this latter threat is more prevalent these days due to the presence of smart speakers like Amazon Echo and Google Home, both of which have had vulnerabilities in the past, allowing for unfettered microphone access. So based on this attacker, what we're really trying to do here is design an end-to-end -end attack that uses the audio information alone from the television to discover exactly what a user is typing. Now, there are a few key benefits or properties of popular smart TV brands, here focusing on those of Samsung and Apple, that actually enable such an attack to potentially exist. The first is that these systems will actually make different sounds for different user actions on the keyboard. There's a distinct noise for scrolling between keys, selecting a character, or even deleting a key. What this means is that just by listening, an attacker can actually distinguish between different actions the user takes on the keyboard. The second property here is that the key selection sound on these systems is actually unique to the keyboard and not present elsewhere on the system. If a user wants to select, say, a video to play, that sound is actually different than the sound made to select the character A when typing. Presence of keyboard-specific sounds means that a user can actually tell, or an attacker can tell when a user is typing as opposed to interacting elsewhere on the television. The final property here is that in their system defaults, the keyboards on these platforms actually have a known layout and always start the cursor on the same key. So if we're trying to design an attack that tracks the cursor as the user moves, we can do so on a keyboard with a known layout from a known starting point. Now, even with these beneficial properties, there are a few key challenges that we have to address or overcome when trying to create this type of attack. The first is that the audio itself does not provide all aspects of the user's movements. In particular, one key aspect that it omits is the direction of user movement on the keyboard. In essence, all movements sound the same no matter which direction they're going. 
What this means is that if we know the cursor is currently on the key G and we hear three movements, the cursor could now be on any one of these keys highlighted in yellow. The problem is actually slightly harder than this because of the fact that users can take non-shortest or suboptimal paths. If we are to hear three movements, it might actually be the case that the user only went a true distance of one away, increasing the candidate space even further. Now, despite these challenges, we actually find that it is indeed possible to construct an end-to-end -end attack that goes from the raw audio of smart televisions and produces a list of the likeliest strings typed by the user. The way our attack works is by breaking the problem up really into two phases. The first is audio extraction, which uses the raw audio from the smart television to construct what we call an intermediate state, named here a move count sequence, which really just characterizes the user's movement on the keyboard. From these movements, we feed it to the second phase of our attack, which is string recovery, which comes up with a list of possible strings matching this interaction on the keyboard with a known layout. And then we rank these strings according to a string prior distribution to find the likeliest results. I'll talk a little bit about both of these phases in a little more detail, starting here first with the audio extraction. Smart televisions make very distinct and consistent sounds for different user actions on the keyboard. This consistency really stems from the fact that the sounds are coming from the platform itself as opposed to any figments of the user's behavior. And because of this consistency, we find that we can effectively identify the sounds using a nearest neighbor matching approach by essentially comparing the sounds observed at runtime to pre-recorded versions offline. Once we're able to establish the sounds created, we can assign the actions associated with these sounds, either movements or selections or deletions, and create this intermediate state, a move count sequence, which really just represents the number of movements the user is making between selections on the keyboard. Once we have the sequence, we feed it to the second phase of our attack, which is string recovery. And the goal of this phase is to find the likeliest strings typed by the user matching this interaction sequence. The way we perform this approach is really by posing the problem as a graph search problem on the, on the keyboard layout by using a variant of Dijkstra's algorithm. The easiest way to see this is just through an example. Here we're, where I've pulled a move count sequence from typing the English word test. And to simplify the example, we'll make a couple of assumptions here. The first is we'll assume that we already know to use an English word prior and that the user is only going to take shortest pads. And we'll actually relax both of these assumptions in a little bit. The way the search works is by first anchoring the approach at the known starting point, here the cursor being on the key Q, and then looking at the first number of moves in our sequence, which is in this case four. This gives us a candidate set for where the user could now be. We add all of these to our search queue, scoring by the frequency of English words prefixed by each of these characters, where certain characters like the digit four can be pruned away because there are no English words starting with this digit. At this point, we just pull the top scoring element off the queue, in this case, the letter T, indexing further into the move count sequence, going distance of two away at this point, and expanding our search queue accordingly. Here with all our strings actually prefixed with T because to get to this point, we would have had to make that selection. So we iteratively continue this process until reaching the end of the move count sequence, at which case the likeliest strings as identified by the approach will be the first that come off the queue. Now the search process actually can become more complicated than this because of the fact that some smart televisions will actually have some dynamic behavior. Samsung smart televisions actually will make inline suggestions when users are known to be typing predictable inputs, where predictability here really refers to the known typing of English words. The way these suggestions work is that upon selecting a key, the system will actually populate the neighboring elements with likely continuations to allow the user to not have to scroll entirely across the keyboard. Now, these continuations are not something that are readily known to the attacker, and in essence, it's something the attacker has to estimate. The benefit, however, is that the continuations are inherently predictable. So the attacker can estimate them effectively by just finding their own likeliest continuations in the string prior of English words they're already using. Now, there are a few key points worth making about these dynamic keyboards. The first is that if we were to type the same string on keyboards with and without suggestions, we'll get very different move count sequences because suggestions will generally reduce the number of moves between selections, especially when those suggestions are useful. The second aspect is that unpredictable inputs like passwords and credit cards 
don't use keyboards with these suggestions because the suggestions are likely not to be useful. Now, one thing you might have noticed about the entire search process is that it's very dependent in its effectiveness on the choice of the string prior. And ideally, if we want to make the best possible attack, we'd like to pick a prior customized to the type of information the user is entering. For example, if we know the user is typing passwords, we'd like to pick a prior maybe accounting for frequencies of characters in common passwords. In contrast, if we know the user is typing an English word, we can restrict our search to the English dictionary, maybe annotating words by frequency in a large corpus. Finally, for things like credit card numbers, we know that users are entering digits only 0 through 9 that also have the additional property of satisfying a checksum. All this is to say that we would like to actually customize the string prior. But it's not obvious from the onset that the attacker actually knows what type of information the user is entering. So to make this inference, we add an additional step to our attack that actually tries to identify the information type in order to customize the prior and effectively improve the attack. Here what we're really trying to do is det determine whether the user is entering credit card numbers versus English ver words versus passwords. And the payment details in the form of credit cards are the easiest to see first, so we'll start here. In the United States, users will enter payment details in forms that look like what's shown here, containing fields like a credit card number, a security code, and a billing zip code. It turns out that each of these fields has very distinctive lengths. And when they incur in rapid succession in successive keyboard instances, this essentially fingerprints when a user is entering payment information. We can therefore customize our priors accordingly to each of the individual fields. Otherwise, we have to tell whether the user is entering an English word versus a password. But if we remember back to the difference in typing dynamics induced by these dynamic suggestions, only English words will use keyboards with suggestions and passwords will not. This creates actually a distributional difference in the move count sequence we observe. So what we can do to identify these pieces of information are to really just classify the type of move count sequence in its underlying keyboard dynamics. Once we identify whether the underlying keyboard is using either suggestions or not, we can use the associated information type to customize the prior. Now the final piece of the attack that I said we would return to is the handling of suboptimal or non-shortest paths between characters. One way we could handle this is by simply considering non-shortest paths at every single point. The challenge with that approach, however, is that it's incredibly costly and expands the search both computationally and also starts to degrade the answer quality. Turns out that we can actually do slightly better by essentially exploiting different figments of the user behavior. To motivate this point, we can look at an example here of a user typing the first four digits of a credit card number. I annotated each of these movements by the timing gaps between the successive moves or the move in a selection. What you can see is that it's this third movement where a user actually makes a suboptimal path. And if we look at our times, there's actually an outlier in the time gap that appears when correcting the suboptimal path. What we actually notice when studying users who type is that they tend to pause when correcting suboptimal paths quite briefly. So if we want to identify when suboptimal paths occur, we simply have to look for these pauses. And when they occur, we consider suboptimality. Otherwise, we can narrow our search to only optimal paths, actually improving or narrowing the search overall and improving the answer quality. So we evaluated our entire attack across 10 different users who type fake but semantically correct credit card details common passwords and web searches into both a Samsung and Apple television. Due to time, I'll talk only about the credit card details and passwords here. And starting with the credit cards, we actually find that our attack can successfully discover 50% of the full payment details within the first 5,000 guesses, where these full payment details constitute getting the credit card number, security code, expiration date, and zip code all exactly correct. Of course, this constitutes a large violation of the user's privacy, considering that an attacker with this information has sufficient details to make purchases on behalf of this user in electronic settings. And if we focus just on, say, specific fields, like the credit card number, the attack can perform much better. The second piece of information I'll highlight here are passwords drawn from a prior leak. And what we find is that our attack can actually exceed random guessing one of these passwords in the list by over 100 times achieving a top 100 accuracy of up to 60% in the best cases. Note that this top 100 accuracy is something important to look at 
because prior work has actually shown that it's reasonable to at least be able to try 100 passwords against rate-limited online services before getting locked out. So what this means is that with a list of 100 passwords, we can readily verify them in, in online settings. So just to conclude here, what we've studied in this work is a new attack against smart televisions that exploits the fact that the audio produced by the television has a key link to the underlying keystrokes entered by the user. And I think as a whole, what this work really presents is another example of how system designers for these smart devices really have to consider the privacy implications of every feature interacting with sensitive data, even if these features appear harmless on the surface. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Let's thank our speaker. So if you didn't already dislike those pesky keyboards here, it's more reason to dislike them. Uh, questions? If you have questions, please, please line up at the mic. Yes, I'm Scott Constable from Intel Labs. I definitely agree on, on point four. This is a good proof point for that. Uh, I, I've owned a smart TV for two years. I don't ever remember typing in a password or a credit card number. That's always done with a smartphone. You like scan a QR code and it um, does that through your smartphone. Is this, is this still a problem? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a great question. Um, it's something we've considered. Uh, to, to th just for everyone, for reference, this is the type of flow that you would have when creating a new account. So this is on, on a Hulu application that we just got from our smart TV in the lab. When you create a new account, you can either determine to sign up on the web, which in which case you'll use your smartphone and do it, or you can sign up on the television itself. I think the point that we're actually trying to show here is that there is a path through this option that is insecure, but it's continually being offered. And there's no um, note that there are potential security problems associated with taking either path. Um, we haven't done a comprehensive study on how frequently users will use one of these pads. We can hypothesize either way, um, but it's at least important to understand that there are potential implications of doing one or the other. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hey, uh, Jeff Twardokas from uh, Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, I have a very related question I wanted to ask. I'm only really familiar with the Apple TV environment, but at least on the Apple TV, when I want to type in a password or anything longer than a couple characters, it's a lot easier for me to pull out my iPhone and just type on it, or sometimes, probably not for payment details or passwords, but if you're trying to harvest other data, you could even just use Siri and dictate it. So have you considered how that on Apple TV or anything else impacts this and whether the attack can be extended to cover that, or do those just mitigate it? Yeah, okay, so, so there are a couple parts to that. I think any time that you pull out your smartphone, you're bypassing the entire keyboard system, so this attack would not apply in those scenarios. Um, if you're doing something like dictating the string that you want to enter, certain televisions won't actually allow you to do that for passwords, some will. Um, I think there is an interesting point there, which is that there's a mental model that if I were to speak aloud, what I'm saying and someone is listening, they're clearly going to know exactly what that is. This type of leakage is far less intuitive. If I'm typing into the television, I don't expect that someone who's hearing the TV make all these noises is actually going to be leaking this information. I think it's really important that users have a proper mental model of exactly where their information is going. This type of leakage being far less intuitive in that sense. But if you were to just speak that to answer your question directly, that does bypass because you're not going to use the keyboard in this way. Okay, thank you. Just then to clarify quickly, you mean the attacker in your model, and I'm sorry if I missed it, is actually in the house with the person? Yeah, well, they, they would be able to understand what, if, you're, if you were to speak like a web search mm -hmm. and they are already listening because they have a microphone, they're clearly going to know what that web search is. A lot of the details I've talked about in the attack here aren't going to be useful to making that determination is my point. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Lachlan Gunn from Alta University. So <clears throat> you mentioned that there wasn't kind of any directional information provided by the sound, though at least do you, do you think that it would be possible to extract that from uh, the signal? Because, for example, in this one where you showed the, uh, like the signal from writing the word test, you could see that there was kind of a gap, I guess, where you went kind of down on the corner. Yeah, yeah. Does this show up in practice, or is this just uh, kind of... So if I understand your question right, you're, um, you're asking, is there a way to infer directions of user movement just by the audio? Yes. Yeah. So, so there is, 
the, the answer is sort of. Um, there are certain types of movement patterns that we can actually extract from just the timing of movements overall. For example, if I have, a, yeah, this will work. If, if the cursor is here on the key A and they, the user like rapidly scrolls horizontally and then switches vertically, that actually will induce a pause as well. That one's a little easier to understand why because you actually have to physically move your hand on the remote and you can detect where those, th that is changing. We did build that into our attack. It does help a little bit, but it's not a huge benefit. Yeah. Thanks. Last question. Hi, uh, I'm Sanket from Stony Brook University. Uh, this is a really great paper. Uh, I just have one question. Uh, so your attack is premised on the fact that you know what the starting position of the key is when, yeah. some, when the user opens a keyboard. Yeah. I wonder how much of this attack will still be valid if you randomize the starting position. Yeah, it's a great question. Let's, okay. Um, I'm, let me find a diagram here that'll help. So, so essentially, the answer is it can help, but it actually isn't complete because of the fact that in some strings, there's, there's this done key that you have to actually scroll to at the end to finish. Mm -hmm. So if I know that you're gonna finish at the done, what you can actually do is look at the problem in reverse and say, I'm gonna anchor at done and then do the string in reverse, reverse all the priors, and that actually tends to work quite well too. Not all strings are like that especially the dynamic suggestions will actually sometimes suggest the done key so you don't have to scroll all the way over there. But for credit card numbers, for example, that, that's something that can be done. So just randomizing the start isn't, usual, isn't usually sufficient for that reason. Okay, so, and just a quick follow-up. Um, yeah. So uh, again, you're premised on the fact that there is an anchor key which, you can, uh, which, which is supposed to be standardized across all keyboard layouts. Is that something that you have noticed? So, sorry, could you repeat the first part again? Uh, basically what I'm asking is, uh, is this, the keyboard layout on every different manufacturer uh, TV, is there a standardized layout that they use? Like the done key is always at one specific position. Yeah, so, so different platforms will have different layouts. Um, like uh, here's an example. Um, so Samsung kind of looks like this QWERTY keyboard style. You have some apps will actually use this like ABC style. Like, and, and then Apple TV is a very linear design. Mm -hmm. We've looked at all of them. Um, the reality is as long as you know the layout, it tends to not make as much of a difference. If you're just analyzing what is the role of the layout, as long, if you're fixing it, it's not a, it's not a huge thing. There have been proposals out there um, to say, well, what happens if you do some randomization of the layout dynamically? So like every time you open the keyboard, it's gonna look a little bit different. Um, that has, of course, usability challenges. So. There are always trade-offs to be made there. I don't know of a single system that's actually implemented that. It's, it's more theory at this point. All right, thank you so much. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Mm.